Hi, I'm Graham Glick, Assistant Provost and Executive Director for Teaching and Learning Plus Technology at Stony Brook University. And this is Innovations in Education. In our show, we feature faculty and staff using innovative approaches and best practices in teaching and applications of educational technology that have had a positive effect on student learning. In this show, I'm joined by Joshua Bowman, who's a lecturer in the Department of Mathematics, and we will be discussing making large classes more intimate. Joshua, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Tell me a little bit about the courses that you teach. I am teaching a first semester calculus course of about 150 students in the class. Okay. Um, my understanding is you use lots of props and videos in your class. I do. I, uh, so I, I think that any teacher wants to uh, sort of make the, the intimate, the, the direct aesthetic appeal of their uh, subject um, clear to the students. But along with that, there's always uh, some new perspectives that can be gained by, by the study of the subject. Uh, and so, for example, I'll, I'll come in one time. Uh, many students coming into college are already familiar with the shape of a parabola. Uh, and so I can bring out a piece of string. I have that in one of my pockets here. And, and just hang this and, and ask them what, what shape it is. Okay. Uh, and, and many of them will think it's a parabola, and that's actually what mathematicians thought for a long time. But they weren't sure, so they just called it a, a catenary, meaning a, a hanging chain. Um, and it's actually not described as a parabola. It's described by uh, a hyperbolic trigonometric function, um, which is not something most students are familiar with. And uh, otherwise, why would you need to even name that? And sometimes it's covered without giving anything like that. And, uh, so something like that is it's something that we do encounter and experience and see the need for that. And in fact, there's a famous piece of architecture based on this shape um, in St. Louis. The, the arch uh, is actually in the shape of a, a catenary. I was um, at the top of that three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so an inverted catenary rather, rather than a parabola, as many people might think. But there are also um, a lot of times that uh, the ideas of, of calculus, I think, are um, made more accessible if we realize how they do relate to our own experiences. Um, when we talk about the position function and its derivative is the velocity and its second derivative is acceleration and second derivative it seems like it's so far away but it's actually what I think is most directly connected with much of our experience. Uh, when we often talk about uh, applications of calculus and position we talk about driving a car mm -hmm. and how the first derivative is your velocity, it's the direction you're moving and how fast you're going. And that's actually not something we experience very much when we're sitting in the car driving. What we, ex what we feel physically is when we start turning, which is an acceleration. It's the second derivative. Right. So I illustrated this by showing a clip from Apollo 13 uh, at the moment of liftoff when they, when they take the, the shuttle off. Uh, and there's this moment when they, they cut the engines, uh, or at least some of the engines, and suddenly all the astronauts are jolted forward. Right. And the question is, you know, what's happening to them? And it looks like maybe what's happening is they're slowing down. But of course, they're not. They're trying to get into orbit. They don't want to slow down. It's just suddenly there's a moment where there's less acceleration. Mm -hmm. And that's what they feel in their bodies. And so things like this, I try to, try to make the connections with the ideas we're talking about. So other than the string, what other props do you use? Uh, I have used it. I brought in a slide rule one time to talk about uh, logarithms. Uh, it's a tool that's passed out of use mostly, but I have my old grandfather's slide rule from mm -hmm. when he was an engineer. Uh, to see now, how would you make that visible in a large class of 150 students? I actually used another clip from Apollo 13 because ah. there is a, a scene in there where for just a moment there's a slide rule that flashes on the screen as they're trying to solve one of their, their problems. <laughs> and a, as I told the students, you know, if you want, really want to show that something's happening in a movie, then, then you use a picture of a slide rule. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have a philosophy that includes two components to teaching mathematics. Tell us about them. So, Mathematics, uh, many mathematicians will tell you that the reason that they go into it is so they find it intrinsically beautiful and, and there's a very much an aesthetic component uh, and we're always looking for elegance and simplicity. Uh, and that is something that one really does want to try and communicate to the students. And, but it's, it's something that, that often takes uh, time or, or a certain uh, inclination to, to see that. There, mathematics also clearly, its history shows that it's been a, a collection of tools that have been developed to mm -hmm. talk about particular problems, to discuss what's happening uh, in the world around us, to give us new ways of seeing things around us. And so, for example, the, 
the how the shape the shape of a hanging chain behaves, or uh, how a bridge behaves, or how we uh, go about going uh, driving down the road. These these sorts of things. Uh, if we can identify what what it is that we're feeling uh, and and what aspect that is, then then we can better understand our own feelings and how to react to them. So, do you try and, and get the students to? have a sense of that beauty? Is that part of your mission when you're teaching? It is something, yes. So there, there are times that um, a lot of formulas can go up on the board and lots of them look very ugly and, mm -hmm. and you, you want to, to show that at some point that we've gotten to the real heart of the matter when we have something that's, that's very simple and that can, you know, has a very uh, simple drawing that goes with it, for so example. So you're distilling things down to their essence, yes. essentially. Okay, and the other perspective? Uh, so this, this aspect of, of trying to make things uh, relate to our daily lives, I've already talked some about the, the driving uh, and acceleration. Um, but even other at areas, we can describe what's going on by using the language of calculus. Uh, I know that there was one day I was talking about what do derivatives tell us and I ended up using a bunch of political examples, actually, uh, which I think somewhat surprised the students mm -hmm. that you could find calculus in politics. But there was a graphic that was put out by the government back in January uh, that was trying to explain uh, how the economy is recovering. And it was uh, a graph that was in a, this beautiful wedge shape. Uh, so you can see it going down and then coming back up. But in this graph, all of the, it was a bar graph, and all the bars came from the top and went down to the shape of this graph. And it's because it was a graph of what the job losses over some period of time was. So you can see that there was some improvement, but uh, what was actually being displayed was, uh, if you were looking at the number of jobs available, was displaying the first derivative of that. It was explaining rate how of loss. The, the rate of loss. And so what you could see is actually that the, the rate of loss was improving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we don't, act, again, this is one case where the first derivative is what we feel. We don't actually feel like the economy is getting better until we actually see the number of jobs increasing. And so that was one example where uh, the language of calculus comes in and helpful to analyze what's going on in this graph. Uh, now, now many students are really intimidated by calculus. How, how do you get them past that to, to see the, the beauty, the simplicity, and so on? One of the, uh, an important thing to always get to, the, to try to do is to talk about, the, talk about it themselves. Uh, there are uh, I, I try to encourage my students to come in and talk to me in my office hours. Um, if you can get them to discuss what's what's going on in, in their own heads and uh, to to work through, often there there are two components to the understanding. There's sort of getting a, an intuitive sense of what's happening, but then there's also being able to formalize it and to communicate mm -hmm. that to somebody else. Uh, and so both it's important to emphasize both of those. So I try to have them. Uh, when possible, discuss, talk in small groups, which you can do even in a large class and things like this. Okay, I understand you use some unique approaches to help them memorize formulae. <laughs> uh, there, there's one in particular that uh, the the quotient rule is sort of a, a famously difficult formula to memorize from calculus, and uh, a lot of students come in um, if they've had calculus before, they've heard that. Uh, there's two functions, there's high and there's low, there's one on top, one on bottom, and they say, you know, it's low d high minus high d low over low squared. Well, this turns out this fits very well to uh, uh, an old blood, sweat, and tears song, and you can sing it along to the tune of the song. And this right and, ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it took some encouraging, but I did get my, my students to sing this, and you can sing low d high minus high d low over low low, that's how the quotient rule goes. It helps that so. you can sing. I'd never be able to do that. <laughs> uh, and rhymes also, or is it just rhyming songs that you tend to use? Just some rhymes and songs like that. Uh, what you really want to do is, um, they, they really appreciate some sort of systematic method of, of describing things, but uh, that, that, that's the sort of thing that you, where you really also want to work for simplicity and elegance and just make it something that's simple. So if I went into your classroom, would I hear the whole class singing this, this rhyme? <laughs> uh, when, we, when we have to differentiate using the quotient rule, yes, oh, there, there wow. are a couple of them we'll, we'll build, yeah. built out with it. Okay, good. Um, there's also a, an approach called the Cornell Good Questions. Tell us a little bit about that. So the Good Questions project was developed a few years ago uh, by some of the faculty and grad students at, at Cornell uh, as, a, as a calculus teaching um, tool. And it's a collection of questions that range from sort of very basic understanding of a topic to, uh, to deeper questions that they may take a bit more th thought to something that actually will probably require some guidance 
from the teachers. Um, these are often intended to be used uh, as part of class discussion. Uh, they, they come in multiple choice format. Uh, a number of teachers will use them with things like the clickers uh, so that the students after they've discussed some can vote. I've just been taking a basic poll with my students. I don't always need something quite so sophisticated as that. But I'll, I'll put the questions up on the board and with the, all the various options and have them talk for a few moments. Uh, and this gives me a chance, it's something that's uh, it's often hard to do in a l large lecture, to walk around and hear what they're saying mm -hmm. uh, and see if they have any questions while they're discussing that. Uh, and then either we'll, we'll talk about the, the problem together and I'll have people defend their answers uh, or I'll have them discuss with someone they disagree, see if they can convince them to the other viewpoint. Uh, and so The Good Questions is, is a resource that's available online uh, that uh, I found very helpful for provoking discussion in the class. Um, do you use clickers or use other polling mechanisms? Uh, I just have them close their eyes and raise their hands. <laughs> and because, because sometimes what you want is you want to know what the actual numbers are. But for something like, like this, I think often what you want to get is, is just an overall sense of how the class is, is, is trending and uh, where you need to spend more time on some, some topics. So primarily, it's a concept checking tool for yes. you. Okay. Websites and graphing software. Uh, so let me preface this by saying that in, in many calculus courses like this, particularly ones with a more theoretical bent, such as the one that I'm teaching, um, we don't allow calculators on the tests. It's not, not something that, um, that we want to test that they know how to use that. We, we want to test that they've got the understanding of the ideas. And uh, when it does come time in their own specialized fields to use uh, some sort of uh, algebra program or calculator, that they can interpret what the computer is mm -hmm. giving to them and not just have to trust it. Uh, um, However, it is important to start introducing them to the tools that are available. There are so many tools uh, around us now. So for example, uh, I use a, a graphing program that just comes installed on, on the Macintosh computer. Uh, and it's a very flexible, powerful program. It's just the grapher. And uh, even if we've already drawn a picture uh, of some function on a board, sometimes just seeing it in a different medium, seeing it projected up on a screen uh, in, a, in a situation where it's easy to manipulate. You can change coefficients and things like this. It mm -hmm. uh, gives you a lot of power to, to play around with uh, what the, the different parameters that we see involved, how, how they change the, the behavior, which is really what calculus is all about, is understanding behavior. Uh, a tool that was certainly not available when I was in college um, is uh, the website Wolfram Alpha, mm -hmm. which it uses uh, almost all of the power of Wolfram's Mathematica software. Uh, and it's, you know, it's very democratic. It's available to anybody who can get it on the internet. They, they don't even need to have their own calculator. Uh, and so just uh, letting them know that these tools are there and, and showing them uh, some idea of how to interface with it. It's, it's, again, very flexible. It will do its best to understand what you're trying to ask it. Uh, and then that gives them a way to, when they're at home, to, to do the theoretical part, to, to do the calculations on their own, which is what we want them to do, but also to check themselves and to do some explorations on their own. So these sorts of things that they really need to know about. So how do you know what's working and what's not working in your classroom? So uh, it, I think it's important to, to keep in, in touch with sort of the, the general feeling of a classroom. You can, you can tell when you're kind of losing them, even, even a large group like that. Uh, there, there's a sort of restlessness. Uh, but if you want something more um, sort of more concrete, uh, a, a mid-course survey or something like this is an important thing. Of course, here at Stony Brook, there are these focus groups which are available, so uh, have a, a staff member come over uh, and talk with the students sometime that I'm outside of the room. Mm -hmm. In smaller classes, what I would often do is just have paper surveys and, and ask how different aspects of the, the class were going and if they found that there were places where they needed me to do some more work to try and get across to them. Uh, in a large tell me a little more about the focus group. And, and yeah, so, and so in a large class, it's, it's the, the, that, that's a little bit too hard to, to collate. But the focus groups uh, is a chance for them to, to break up into small groups and actually talk about the class. So I'm not even just getting the, the individual feedback. They're discussing with each other what aspects they like. They're giving feedback collectively. They're doing it anonymously uh, in a very open-ended way you know, because they can say anything they want to, whatever they like or dislike about the, the class. Uh, and so what I found is a, a number of very encouraging comments came out of that. But I also I got the feedback in the afternoon after they had uh, after they had discussed with the staff member, and the very next week I could already start Im implementing some of the suggestions they had said they so wanted the to see. So the staff member 
the students come to a consensus, the staff member compiles a report, gives that report to you. Yes. Uh, and and <coughs> it includes things like, we really like his jokes. Uh, we'd like to see more examples. Uh, and so this, this lets me know, you know, I can, I can keep telling jokes. I'm not losing them at that point. And, and uh, I should do more examples to, to step them through the various uh, ideas that we're dealing with. Okay. So, Josh, if you had a new mathematics instructor come to you and say, you know, this is my first time teaching, what would your little kernel of expertise and knowledge be for that person? Uh, so th I would say two things. Uh, one is ev always make sure you're prepared. <laughs> the, the, uh, I think there are a lot of <coughs> mathematicians who think they can, can go in a lecture off the cuff. Uh, and that, that turns out to be very difficult to communicate because you, you often yourself will get caught up in the details. So, so be prepared. Uh, but also do try to relate uh, to the students, to, to realize that you're going to be giving them information. You're going to be trying to meet them halfway. Uh, but you need to let them know where that halfway is. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need to uh, encourage them uh, to come and talk with you. And, and I don't mean just in office hours. I mean to, to metaphorically come to that halfway point and be, be in, engaged in the discussion. Uh, you really want to see what does connect with their experience and how can you, um, how can you make that a, a common discussion ground. Okay. Joshua, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you. If you have any questions for Joshua, you can post them on the TLT website at tlt.stonybrook.edu or on our Facebook site, just search for Innovations in Education. Hope you'll join me for the next interesting show of Innovations in Education. Mm -hmm.